Welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Here with me today is David Muller, the Samuel B. Eckert Professor of Engineering in Applied and Engineering Physics at Cornell. He also serves as the co-director of the Kavli Institute at Cornell for Nanoscale Science. David, thank you so much for joining us today. To get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in nanotechnology? Thank you for having me here. I think even as a kid, I was kind of fascinated by science and particular computers. And so I always kind of wondered, how would you make a faster computer? Originally, I imagined, well, I just put a whole bunch of them together. Why couldn't I do that? As an undergrad, I kind of learned why that wasn't going to work. And I still was fascinated about, well, how do I make these things faster? And the thing they'll teach you is you make them smaller. I continue to have this fascination. I put a little bit aside when I went off to do my PhD. But when I finished the PhD, I joined Bell Labs. And the question that they were starting to think about at that time was, how fast could you make the fastest computer? And that question translates down to, how small could you make the smallest part of the computer? And so that was, for me, the interesting question. And it turned out that the smallest part of the computer is a very thin layer in the transistor, which is the switch that basically controls the information flow, and was just a few atoms thick. And we worked out that the reason it could only get five atoms thick was because of the properties of the materials at the nanoscale. They became different. And if we made it thinner than five atoms, it wouldn't behave like a switch anymore. So to solve that problem, we actually had to be able to see every individual atom, and we had to be able to know what each atom was doing there. And the answer to that question of how thin it can get is literally what is in every computer built after 2004 and every cell phone built off to 2007. So how did you get from Bell Labs to this recent announcement of abilities of an electron microscope? So the tool I was using at Bell Labs to understand how small we could make things was a then modern electron microscope, which is a lot more primitive than what we have today. Nevertheless, it let us look at atoms with a resolution that's about 10 times worse than what we have now. It got us into the atomic world, but it was barely there. It was like the Wright Brothers sort of level of planes. We've had a journey since then of let's start with the Wright Brothers' first flight, and now we're flying jet aircraft across the Atlantic is kind of the difference of scale of speeds that we're looking at. I was very interested in pushing the technique of how do I make a better tool that lets us look at and understand the nanoscale world, because these questions of what is an individual atom doing is a critical question to whether these devices inside the computer are going to work or are going to fail. And we could just about see things, but not quite enough to do the things we wanted to do. And so... That kind of drove my next passion, which is trying to get a clearer image and trying to get more information as well as a clearer image. At the time, to form an image, we were throwing away most of the electrons we were shooting at the atoms we were looking at. And so I wanted to build a detector that would be able to collect and use all of the information that we could learn and not have to throw things away. So I want to back up a little bit and ask you to describe the recent results that you've published about being able to see atoms and some of their properties. So first, a little bit about your recent accomplishment and your colleagues, and then next, why is that important? The starting point is we've been able at some level to see atoms for a while now. The electron microscopes and the scanning and tunneling microscopes have let us do this since the early 1980s. And it resulted eventually in 1986, I think, the shared Nobel Prize between the folks who invented the electron microscope and the folks who invented the scanning and tunneling microscope. But the resolution wasn't that great. You could kind of see things, but it was just the edge of it. The next thing that happened with the electron microscopes was kind of asking, well, why were the images so blurry? 
Because to see an atom and resolve it, an electron microscope, when it boils down to the end of the thing, it's a lens for focusing electrons to doing the imaging. And we can see much smaller things than light because the wavelength of an electron is much smaller than the wavelength of light. But the problem with the electron microscopes was the quality of the lenses was terrible. It was kind of like looking through a beer bottle and trying to use a beer bottle as a magnifying glass that the, the aberrations of electron lenses are actually very similar to the optical aberrations you would get from a beer bottle. That, that tells you how bad the lenses are. And it's not because people were stupid. It's because Maxwell's equations, the equations that govern the motion of a charged particle in free space, just don't cooperate with you. The next thing people figured out was, okay, these lenses are bad. How can I correct the lenses? which is kind of like trying to put spectacles on these things, except for electrons, you can't build something like spectacles. You end up with a sort of a Rube Goldberg piece of equipment where I have an arrangement of about 100 different optical elements and I have to try to get all of them focused at the same time. And that's a hard thing to do. And it wasn't until we had fast computers that we could actually get these things lined up to do that. And that happened in the 1990s. And those things, we kind of had a pretty good resolution limit of about an angstrom, which is close to the shortest bond length you're going to get in, in materials. And that was where we had a resolution limit around about 2008. And we've been stuck since then because we just couldn't make things more complicated. It was just already really complicated and really expensive. So that's kind of a long background to where we come in. What we wanted to do is an old idea. If you imagine, you know, what does my electron beam look like is I am maybe throwing dodgeballs at someone on a field. And if I can't see them and I randomly throw dodgeballs, I'll know roughly where they are because when the ball hits them, it scatters to the side. So then if I can keep track of the angles that these balls are going at, I have a rough idea where the person is and maybe how big they are and what shape they are from the way that the balls scatter. And if I do this with a fairly focused beam, I can get more information than I would just from imaging with the lens. So our idea was if I can collect all of the scattered electrons that I throw at an atom, I should be able to learn more about that atom than if I was just looking to see did an electron go through or not. To do this, the idea are conceptually reasonably simple, but in practice required an, an incredibly good detector to handle the different intensities. And so we had to build that. And that in itself was almost 15 years of work to get to building that detector. And then when we did that, the next challenge is how do you interpret the data, which is a huge amount, and putting all those things together got us to this recent paper that we just published where we had managed to improve the resolution of the electron microscope to be about a tenth of a bond length. And now what happens is it's not just that we get to see where the atom's nucleus is, but we get to see how it's wobbling around. And those thermal vibrations of the atom are in fact now what limits the resolution of the microscope. So now, with these new detectors, for the first time, the images that we see of atoms is limited not by the resolution of the instrument, but by the actual thermal fluctuations of the atoms themselves. And this puts us into a new regime of imaging where when we look at the material, we can actually see how the atom is, is moving around and where it's moving. And that is going to tell us a little bit about where the bonds between atoms are soft and where the bonds between atoms are strong. So there's so much to unpack there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with what is the detector made out of? So the detector itself is a silicon chip made in a foundry. The way to think of it is it would be like not too different to the little camera on your digital phone, except it's meant to detect electrons and not light. And the detector itself is able to detect a huge difference in range of intensities. So the way to think of what it can do is imagine I was trying to take a picture of you and you had the sun shining from behind you. So I would have a picture of you and I'd have a picture of the sun. This detector has the dynamic range of intensities that it could take a picture of the sun and get the details of all of the sunspots on the surface of the sun and at the same time get a picture of your face and all the shadows on your face. 
So that's really exciting. So if your advancement is focused on the detector itself, is that something that can be retrofit in other instruments? It can. And the first one that we built, in fact, was detachable and we could stick it on all the microscopes we had as we kind of ran around trying to find space to test it. And the detector itself, we've licensed the technology to the largest electron microscope company in the world, and they're now actually building copies of it and selling it commercially. Great to see that it's moving into the marketplace so other people can take advantage of this technology as well. So why do you care if you can see atoms at this level? So the success and failure of most modern technologies in the end comes down to what a single layer of atoms is doing between dissimilar materials. That everything we make is not just made out of one thing, it's made out of things that are stuck together. And where they stick together, usually it comes down to that last plane of atoms. And if you want to know what the atoms are doing there, well, you've got to get in there and look at them. Or you can find out the hard way when it breaks. A classic example would be the Liberty Bell. It's fractured because there's a layer of bismuth atoms that got to the boundary between two grains of copper. So things like turbine blades care greatly about what impurities are in the material and where those impurities go determine whether everything sticks together or falls apart. Obviously, in nanoelectronics, we have lots of different materials that are assembled together to make your computer chip, and how they behave is critically important. In chemistry, we care about catalysts, and there what you have is, in many cases, nanoparticles that you want to basically absorb atoms that you're trying to get a reaction to go with, and then you have to let them go afterwards if you want that useful product to be collected. And so... Now we have a technique that I can look at those atoms sitting on the nanoparticle and I can figure out which ones are going to be strongly bonded there and which ones are going to be weakly bonded. If I'm looking at a battery, I can see which things are running around to help conduct electricity and which are forming horrible blobs that are growing in ways that you don't want to happen. So all of these areas of physics and chemistry and materials science depend essentially on knowing structure at the atomic scale. Now that you have this new detector and you can image atoms at such a small level, how can other researchers have access to this technology? We've put it on the electron microscopes that we have at Cornell that are part of our central facility. And so people can access this through Paradigm, which is our materials innovation platform and write a user proposal to come and and use the instrument themselves. The earlier version of our detector, we've also licensed it commercially to the biggest electron microscope company in the world, and they're actually selling it as part of their instruments. But the latest cutting-edge technology is available at our materials innovation platform. So I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the NNI and the nanotechnology community. One of the things that we talk about is the interdisciplinarity of nanoscience. And the tools that you've been talking about are, you know, used in a lot of different applications of nanoscience. So what has been your experience working with people from different disciplines and how do you feel the electron microscopy supports the interdisciplinary nature of the work? When I worked at Bell Labs and in particular worked with a lot of the industrial parts of the lab, the way we tackled problems quickly and efficiently was we would assemble a team of experts from all the different areas that we needed to solve that problem. So everyone was an expert in their area. And then the challenge was you had to make sure you could speak the language of your colleagues. And if you trained to do this by doing this a lot, this happened very efficiently and very naturally. And at Cornell, that's more or less the style of how we do the science as well, particularly in our nano center and in our MRSEC as well, our Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, that the groups tend to be experts in a particular area. And then when a problem comes up, you assemble that group of experts together and everyone's worked with each other previously, except, you know, as faculty. And so when you bring the students in, you can kind of help let the students learn the language of the other students. And when they're working together for the first time, you can kind of guide them 
and you make the electron microscope student go and learn how the student is growing material, grew the material, so you can understand how difficult that is. And you don't just keep asking, oh, can you grow me another crystal? Similarly, you want the student who's building the device to come sit on the electron microscope and watch everything that goes wrong the first time. And when the students get together and they work with each other, they get to learn and respect the other students' skills and know that each is an expert in what they're doing. And this is incredibly important for both the success of the project, but how does each individual person get recognition? And when you're specialized in what you're doing, it's very clear who the theorist was. It's very clear who the electron microscopist was. It's very clear who built the device. And everyone can then get appropriate recognition for their own work. And this is a different approach from when one group doesn't talk to all the other groups and tries to do everything themselves. This tends to lead to a environment that is a lot more political and causes a lot more friction between groups. You hit on the progress that you made through the years and how long it took to get to this discovery. This discovery was not made in the past two years. It was based on work that's been done over the past several decades. From your perspective, and not just electron microscopy, but tools broadly in order to fabricate and characterize nanomaterials, can you give your perspective on the role that these tools have? The tools are very much enabling technologies. The mission of what we set at the Kavli Institute at Cornell was when we looked at what was available on campus, we had a very good nanofabrication foundry that we could build things in. We had our material science center. But those are places where you get to use these tools. And what we had a gap in was where do you create and develop new methods that enable new technologies. Again, you know, a lot of the challenge being the long time scale before a you can make a new tool that actually is both the first success, hey, look, we actually did it, and then how do you make it usable that everyone can use it at scale? The AFM is maybe an example of something that actually happened remarkably quickly. The STM came first, surprisingly, and then the AFM, you know, the first one was pretty crude, and it took about five, six years before it had been simplified sufficiently. You could put one in every lab. And then the STM turned out to be much more complicated because of the need for the vacuum system so that it's used in more specialist labs, whereas AFMs are like ubiquitous. You know, the initial surge of successes with AFMs, a lot of it was developed at universities and then spun off as startups. And a lot of those startup companies eventually were either collapsed or got bought up by bigger companies because the next challenge is how do you develop the next thing? And that requires a time scale and infrastructure that they'd run out of time and money, basically, because it would take another 10 years to get that next innovation. And so, again, you need things like university groups or national lab groups spending a longer time scale working on these things to get your next tool going. We've got into, with our detectors, a good cadence of, of what it would take to develop the next one. And then the one after that, and the one after that, which is because in some sense we're almost tied to the semiconductor technology and how they would develop things for the next generation of computer chips. You can kind of imagine a similar scale going on with what we'd be doing with our detector. But in order for it to be useful, it's got to be simple enough. It can be deployed at scale. And this takes a time that is longer than the natural duration of a single grant. That's the hard thing, I think, that all instrument technique developers struggle with, is that there are actually relatively few mechanisms to fund instrumentation because of the timescale involved. And what does get funded by peer review tends to be relatively short scale and relatively conservative in ambitions because peer reviewers just don't believe crazy things that we dream of that we'd really like to do because you haven't worked out all the details yet. And that's where, in fact, for us, having the private foundation money helped us get started because I think if we'd had to rely on traditional funding mechanisms, no one would have believed what we wanted to do, that you know, your own peers are often your own worst critics. Based on your experience, do you have any advice for students what I've learned is you need a solid foundation, and you also need to understand how to apply that. So the motto at Cornell's Applied and Engineering Physics program is, speak, is, is learn physics, speak engineering. 
you got to be able to do both of those things. I don't mean it to just be the only way you can do this is learn physics. But, you know, if you're a chemist, the motto then would be, well, I would have to learn chemistry. I'd have to speak engineering as well, because engineering is that team exercise of where we all get together and construct something that is bigger than the individual parts. And for the instrumentation projects, it requires a range of disciplines and being able to work with people from other disciplines is very important. David, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? One thing for us is why do we build the things that we build? It's not just for the sake of building it. There's got to be some purpose to it. Most of the time when I've thought of trying to build something crazy, it's because there's a particular problem I'm trying to solve. Usually the problem we're solving is not, oh, I want to see an atom. It's more a why is this thing doing the thing that it's doing? The driving problems are sort of, there's something we don't understand and we'd like to understand it. And we're building something to learn something about nature. And in many cases, we don't know what the answer to the question is. And what we find out is often so surprising. In many cases, it wasn't even the thing we were thinking of looking for. A lot of joy of working at the atomic scale is you stumble across unexpected things you never anticipated.